Good evening. A Spanish proverb addresses the world of architects as follows. Tell me to what you pay attention and I'll tell you who you are. Could it be the critics who are the source of the subject matter to which architecture directs its attention? In the enduring academic pursuit of who came first, a 19th century British poet, Matthew Arnold, is often acknowledged as the first modern critic. Arnold announced that the purpose of modern criticism was to know the best that is known and thought in the world, and in its turn making this known to create a current of true and fresh ideas. So Arnold's generic critic is charged with examining what is current, uncovering what is exceptional, and suggesting the next adventure for architecture. Are there any qualifiers? Let's try the Australian Robert Hughes, who once characterized the output of New York artists of the 90s as garrulous, over-conceptualized, and feverishly secondhand, an incisive, sardonic, contemptuous prognosis on the art of an entire city for a decade. So shy and self-effacing won't work. Or Lewis Mumford, seated for years in a chair at the New Yorker magazine, ever apprehensive of what he called the megatechnic civilization, who once referred to the under construction Yamasaki World Trade Center towers as purposeless giantism and technological exhibitionism. In the face of the applauding aficionados of technical prowess qua architecture, Mumford's savaging of the myth of the machine and by implication his critique of its digital inheritors remains an indictment of the machine adulation culture to this day. Then there's Herbert Mouchamp, the New York Times explorer, often slumming in Los Angeles in the 90s, anti-New York New Yorker, who made the LA architecture adventure plausible and intelligible in the face of equal opposition parts of contempt and disinterest. And finally, there's Paul Goldberger, who preceded Herbert at the New York Times and followed Mumford at the New Yorker. Goldberger delivers a hybrid advocacy mixing obligations to political egalitarianism, design pluralism, and spatial adventurism, minus the moralizing of Mumford or the cantankerousness of Hughes or the idiosyncrasy of Mouchamp, but with his own private interrogatory of content in contemporary architecture. Definitive interpretive meanings are elusive at the beginning of the 21st century as the increasing obscuritanism of the architecture discourse complicates the critic's task. The idealist manifestos of the 1920s are now replaced with an acronym-laden nomenclature making the single-minded prognoses of Hughes and Mumford and even Mouchamp non sequiturs today. Paul Goldberger's voice is a crucial bridge, transitioning the vagaries of the acronym era to the plausibility of a reformulated architectural ideal. A people Epipole was a fifth century battle between Athenians and Syracusans, a, favorite, a favored Matthew Arnold topic 
that was fought in the middle of the night. Goldberger's <clears throat> rock group of choice, the Grateful Dead, applied the epipole metaphor to the contemporary challenge of locating critical meaning in architecture when the darkness of battle obscures both friend and foe. As the dead put it, you know I've been a soldier in the armies of the night. I will try to give you just a little sometimes, just a little light. Sometimes just a little light. Please welcome Mr. Paul Goldberger from Epipole, who will identify architecture's friends and enemies by providing SciArc with just a little light. Good evening. I, I think I've been waiting all my life for an Eric Owen Moss introduction. So I feel that one, one, of, my, one of my great life objectives has now been achieved. So, so th thank you. Um, although, I'm not sure that I ever said The Grateful Dead was actually my rock group of choice, but, but that's okay. I, I, I like them and I like the quote, so it's okay. Um, there's still time, there's still time, true, true enough. I mean, I actually, like, like all New Yorkers, I actually always had a weakness for the Beach Boys. But, um, <laughs> anyway, I, I'm, I'm now about to do something almost unheard of, certainly at SciArc uh, or, or almost any other architecture school, which is to uh, give a talk without images. Uh, I'm gonna do that because I'm gonna do something else that might be unheard of at SciArc, which is to give a talk that is not fully and completely about architecture. What I want to talk about is words and about their relationship to architecture. And I'll only be talking indirectly about buildings, because what I really want to talk about is communicating about buildings and how that happens or, or doesn't happen, as the case may be. You probably know whatever buildings I make reference to anyway, and you can't use images to explain the effect of words uh, unless you're one of those people who uses those idiotic PowerPoint images where people put a few keywords up on the screen while, while they're speaking. Uh, I hope I don't ever sink quite that low. Um, in any case, I, I will try my best in the next few minutes to make you not miss not looking at pretty pictures. What I really want to talk about is the relationship between your profession and the rest of the world, and what role people like me have historically played in shaping and even sometimes controlling what that relationship is. For most people in Los Angeles, the, the way into architecture, other than seeing it from the freeway, the way architecture connects to their lives is, has traditionally been by reading Chris Hawthorne in the LA Times, the way people in New York, as Eric just reminded us, once read Herbert Mouchamp and then Nikolai Orosov, or at least some of them do. Today, I'm not so sure. The LA Times is not what it used to be, and neither is any other newspaper. Most of them are broke or heading there fast, and there seem to be fewer and fewer architecture critics in the mainstream media. There were never very many anyway, and things are not going in the right direction. Architecture critics were always viewed as something of a luxury by newspapers. Most of us in this room would not agree particularly, but that's another story for another time. And now almost no newspapers in the country can afford luxuries at all. This has serious implications for you, for everyone in this room, because it isolates the profession farther from the public. It makes the architecture profession seem distant and, much worse, makes it seem to far too many people irrelevant off the radar. So it's impossible to separate anything we might say about architecture criticism from what we might call a broader crisis in journalism, which, as everyone knows, has affected every mainstream publication there is from 
the smallest to the largest. I think it's fair to say that no publication is as powerful as it once was, that nothing, not the New York Times, not the New Yorker, not anything, has the kind of hegemony that it once did. No institution dominates in such a way as to be able to set the agenda any more than any single media organization today can set the agenda for politics or economics or anything else. The context of the overall landscape is simply too different and has changed more completely in the last 10 or 15 years than in the 75 years before that. Television, despite expectations to the contrary, didn't threaten print journalism the way the internet has. It just added another medium to the mix. Now, of course, it's something else altogether. Even those publications that have established themselves reasonably well online, like the New York Times, don't hold sway over the world as they once did. If, as A.J. Liebling once famously said, freedom of the press belongs mainly to those who own one, well then, today, of course, Everybody owns the equivalent of a press. Technology means that the playing field is leveled, and now there are a zillion voices out there all clamoring to be heard. If everyone's on the playing field, I'm not sure what kind of game you actually end up having on it. Crowdsourcing has many virtues, but raising the level of critical discourse on architecture isn't one of them. In architecture, as in so many fields, the question is whether authority means as much as it once did, and if so, how in this new environment is authority achieved and maintained? The mainstream publications, the ones with a tradition and a history and an ongoing commitment to architecture criticism, certainly possess some degree of ongoing authority. The New York Times architecture column isn't building blog. Then again, building blog maybe isn't the best example I could come up with because Jeff Manaw has probably done better than anybody else at achieving or establishing authority entirely through new media without any connection whatsoever to old media. And to many readers, particularly younger ones, the degree of authority possessed by something like building blog and the authority possessed by the New York Times isn't very different. In any event, whether they possess greater authority or not, mainstream publications struggle to make themselves heard within this new and constantly shifting mix, as well as to shoulder the costs of maintaining what we might call the physical infrastructure of print. In many ways, the situation of print publications today is not unlike that of retail merchants with brick and mortar stores to maintain struggling to hold their own against internet competition. While the plight of newspapers today is not exactly like, say, Best Buy trying to compete against Amazon, it's closer than we might have ever imagined it could be. What makes it different, I suppose, is that there's no media equivalent of Amazon, since another effect that technology's had has been to break apart the audience into smaller and smaller and more specialized segments. Now, the effect of all this as I said, goes far beyond architecture. The turmoil in journalism affects every discipline. But I think architecture criticism has special challenges. One of them is that new media is particularly tempting, especially now, because it's easier and easier to transmit images. I had a long conversation about new media with my criticism class at Parsons in New York at the end of the last semester, and they concluded that blogs, to them, were old hat. The future, they insisted, was in image-driven apps like Tumblr and Pinterest. I can see the point. New media, whether in the form of blogs or Pinterest or Twitter, makes pictures of everything available all the time, instantly, and new images can spread like wildfire. This has its usefulness in architecture criticism in a way that it doesn't say in literary criticism. The idea of media functioning is a kind of continuously scrolling portfolio, showing you everyone's new work, a constant feed, 
does have a certain appeal. It certainly plays to the strengths of this technology. Everything is now shorthand, either visual shorthand or written shorthand, one of my students said, and this is right again. Twitter, in its way, actually isn't such a terrible venue for architecture criticism. A lot of buildings aren't worth more than 140 characters. Now once, if a building wasn't worth writing an entire column about, critics would say nothing about it at all. But there are plenty of situations in which 140 characters is just right, either because it's all you ever need to say, or because it serves as a useful summary of a larger point, as well as a reminder to people that you have something else to say and where they can find it. Now that I, I've moved recently from the New Yorker to Vanity Fair, I find myself writing at, at three different scales. The long form of the occasional article in the print magazine, the medium length form of a casual blog entry, which is a somewhat less formal article that's only published on the web and which can be pulled together quickly and respond to events if necessary, and then the really short form of Twitter, which can be used to take care of those subjects about which there isn't all that much to say or quick and off-the-cuff observations, as well as to remind people that there's a new blog post or article. I think we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which the new media is all self-referential. Most of my Twitter feed sometimes seems to consist of links to other things, which themselves, of course, have links to other things. The world increasingly feels like one big hyperlink. If I look back at some of the tweets I've written lately, they include a certain number of short observations that did feel right for the scale and the timetable of Twitter. I, I, just the other day, I um, was in Denver and I wrote a 140 character review of Brad Klopfel's Clifford Still Museum, not because it wasn't worth much more, but because I really liked it and I wanted to say something instantly. And I wrote, finally saw Brad Klopfel's Clifford Still Museum in Denver, beautiful, serene, strong, and understated modernism in harmony with the art. It's sort of like reducing criticism to a haiku, I suppose, just like another one from last month. In Nantucket, for the first time in five years, to talk about preservation. Can there be such a thing as too many shingles? Stay tuned. I also found myself in a, in a fascinating dialogue with several other critics on Twitter about an op-ed piece in the New York Times a couple weeks ago complaining about the High Line, which has become a kind of sacred cow. But it deserves to be, and the arguments against it were reverse snobbery of the worst sort, I thought. Anyway, this stuff pours across your screen without end, sort of like the surf. The challenges are in how you filter all of it, and in the random way in which we encounter much of what we see, given how this new level playing field is so full of players that, as I said a moment ago, I'm not sure how the game even is supposed to proceed. Maybe a better metaphor might be that of the curator. Who is going to curate the material that pours across our computer screens all the time? It never stops, as I said. While I've been standing here talking to you in the last few minutes, I've probably missed hundreds of tweets, and two or three of them might actually be interesting. Plenty of the things I discover this way are things that I might not otherwise have seen, and for that too, the new media is invaluable. I don't know how I functioned before Arc News Now, the daily feed of links to news and criticism from around the world that I'm sure you know. And there's Architects Newspaper and Architect Magazine and Dezine and Arc Daily and Sucker Punch Daily and so many other sources. I must say next to Twitter, an early and relatively discursive blog like the Design Observer seems as loquacious as Lewis Mumford. There's almost too much architecture visible in various forms of media, and yet at the same time, there's not enough real architecture criticism. I have to admit that some fear, that, to some fear rather, that 
Alexandra Lang's excellent new book, some of you may have seen it, called Writing About Architecture, which was published last spring, will turn out to be an elegy to a fading craft, something she certainly didn't want it to be. But what we might call long-form writing about architecture has always had a tentative status within the world of journalism. Even when print ruled the world and long-form writing was more the norm in every field, the position of architecture criticism as a discipline worthy of critical attention was never all that secure, despite the presence of such towering figures as Lewis Mumford and Aidan Louise Huxtable and the Pulitzer Prize Board's decision in 1970 to make Huxtable the very first winner of the then new category of a Pulitzer for distinguished criticism. You couldn't ask for more recognition of the value of architecture as an appropriate subject for critical inquiry than that decision 42 years ago to honor an architecture critic with a Pulitzer Prize in criticism before any music critic, film critic, art critic, theater critic, or literary critic had been so honored. Since then, five other architecture critics have won this prize and four others have been named as finalists. A remarkable number when you consider how few architecture critics there actually are. As a percentage of total practicing architecture critics, the number who've been either Pulitzer Prize winners or finalists has to be many times that of film critics or music or art critics. And yet this is still considered a marginal subject for criticism. So in times of economic pressure, when newspapers are closing bureaus and laying off reporters, an architecture critic's position is among the most vulnerable. And we all know that the less architecture criticism there is, the lower the demand for it becomes. Since good writing creates interest that brings about demand, and the absence of writing is felt mainly by people already committed to the field, not by people who don't know what they're missing. So it's a vicious cycle, really, in which reducing the amount of architecture criticism reduces the sense that it's important and worthwhile. But I think that architecture criticism is a tough sell for many editors, not only because of the state of the economy and the wrenching transitions that technology is bringing to journalism. It's also because despite the success and fame of some of the practitioners of this craft, many people aren't entirely sure what it actually is and what it should be doing. It's a paradox because we're living in a time when architecture is more than ever a part of the public discourse, when people know architects' names, when they pay attention to what gets built, well, to some of what gets built, and the whole phenomenon known by that truly awful word of starchitecture seems to many of us in the field to have become almost too much a part of the culture so that we often feel a responsibility not to fan its flames further. The reaction against all of this, against celebrity architecture, is sometimes motivated by a genuine and admirable sense of social responsibility and a recognition that social issues have not been at the forefront of the architectural discourse as much as they should have been in the last few years. But this reaction has already become excessive and results in what seems to me to be a growing amount of architecture criticism that is arrogantly indifferent to creative ideas and to awkward attempts to right the balance like a lot of what we just saw at the Venice Biennale. I'm almost ready to now start a reaction against the reaction and to say that however infuriating it hasn't been an entirely bad thing for architecture because it has put it more than ever in the public eye. I know that inevitably means that ideas are simplified and often cheapened and vulgarized, causing understandable distress among those who cherish the notion of architecture as an intellectual pursuit. We've seen huge amounts of that in the last decade. And it can be infuriating to see architecture treated as part of the culture of celebrity, 
not to mention to have to listen to the constant refrains from architects about how much they hate the term starchitect, which seems invariably to come disingenuously from those architects who court publicity the most. In fact, uh, the other day I read an interview with Richard Rogers in the Financial Times in which he said he hated the term because, and I quote, I don't like star anything. In the end, we are all people. Perhaps a slightly curious vote for egalitarianism from an architect who was known officially as Lord Rogers of Riverside. In any case, much as I hate the cheap glitter of this term, I, I, as I said, I'm disinclined to dismiss the phenomenon altogether since it has brought architecture more firmly into the public realm, made it more central to civic discussion. And as it's hypocritical for architects to revel in public attention while pretending to be above it, it's equally hypocritical for architecture critics to take the position that there's not some partial social good in the greater visibility for architecture, however annoying many of its specific manifestations may be. In any event, all of this has to, I hope, have some relevance to the larger question that bring us all here. What is the state of architecture criticism today? Why should architecture criticism even exist? Does it make any difference? Can it do any more than just enlighten and entertain a few readers who come to it already interested in architecture? Or can it truly shape the city? And how is new media going to change it? We've just been talking about two opposing trends, two conflicting sets of facts. On the one hand, there's the crisis in journalism, inevitably adding pressure to what has not, even in different times, been what anyone would call a large field. As I said, architecture critics have never been plentiful. But on the other hand, there is this greater sense of engagement that people almost everywhere seem to have right now with the built environment. This heightened sense of caring about what their houses and streets and neighborhoods and downtowns and public spaces will look like and will feel like to use. The mysterious thing is how architecture criticism sometimes seems unable to be capable of addressing these things in a way that people who employ architecture critics, which is not any of you, but editors, appear to find meaningful. I'm as willing as anyone to lay at least some of the blame at the feet of editors, many of whom seem, as I said a few minutes ago, not to understand our field very well. But I think that we as critics need to take some responsibility too. Architecture criticism has too often removed itself from the very public discourse that architecture itself has entered. I don't think the paroxysms of pleasure at every single swoop and curve of Zaha or repetitions of Rem Koolhaas's latest disingenuous pronouncements about the irrelevance of architecture or celebrations of a certain young Danish architect who has become the latest celebrity architect with such astonishing speed that it makes the careers of Zaha and Rem seem almost plodding. All of these things are, to one degree or another, inside baseball. And they serve mainly to accentuate the sense of a gap between architecture criticism and the lay public, a public which, whether or not it chooses to participate in any dialogue about architecture, is, after all, its users, at least so far as public architecture is concerned. Now this, of course, makes architecture different from anything else that is generally considered to fall within the realm of cultural criticism. The average person chooses the music he or she hears, the films they see, the books they read, the theater they attend. But other than the house you live in, you almost never choose the architecture you experience. It's imposed upon you, and by you I mean not you in this room, but the world, often by forces over which people have little 
or no control. When architecture criticism is doing its job, it helps people understand these forces at least a little bit better and gives them at least some sense of agency over them. Not much, I know, but some. And it should give you at least some understanding of how things come to be, of why they are as they are, and of how else they might be imagined. The ubiquity of architecture in our lives should lead to a demand for much more architecture criticism, for much more writing of every kind about it. But I think it sometimes works in the opposite way. Because architecture is always there, always around us, always visible, yet seemingly so uncontrollable by us. We tend to tune it out. And by we, of course, I mean the average person, not critics themselves. I think people develop a kind of automatic numbness to a lot of the architecture that they see every day a kind of, as a kind of protective measure. It's not just because some of it is too painful to look at. It's more because most of it is just too much trouble to look hard at. There's just too much of it all the time, all over the place, at every moment, and it's hard to pay attention to and harder still for many people to have any sense that it matters, that the architecture around them can have any effect on their lives. It's the implicit mission of architecture criticism to help people understand that architecture does matter, of course, and why it does. That's why I'm actually not all that distressed at the recent trend toward more socially oriented criticism, even at the New York Times where the current critic has done an abrupt and total about face from the position of his two most recent predecessors. If the Times lately has come to define architecture as narrowly in one direction as it once did in another, in time I hope there will be a more inclusive balance. As there's been, I think it's fair to say, for a certain amount of time at both the LA Times and the Chicago Tribune, both of which have long traditions of architecture criticism as relating to the broader issues of the city and where the current critics have for several years made an effort to balance political, cultural, and aesthetic concerns, not to mention been comfortable writing about single buildings as well as about planning issues, preservation issues, and urban design. It's not really all that hard to do everything. Architecture criticism, like architecture itself, needs to be comfortable on multiple scales and to be written with the recognition that different circumstances demand different kinds of writing. It needs, in other words, to be comfortable with the notion that architecture is art and is not art at once. That it is an experience of the everyday and also potentially an experience of the transcendent. Criticism needs to take both sides of this equation as its subject. This is not being equivocal or indecisive. It's just being real about what architecture is. Buildings do not just happen. As every one of you knows, and I hope is reminded all the time here, they're the products of a peculiar combination of artistic vision, money, political wherewithal, and engineering skill. To the extent to which it is possible to say something about the process by which buildings happen, the critic has to. Not to excuse the results, no critic should ever do that, but to place the building within a context that enhances its meaning. You understand Palladio a lot better if you know that the villas he designed around Vicenza in the 16th century were not just expressions of classical grandeur, but attempts to enhance the image of his aristocratic clients, whose houses were as often as not working farms. You understand Herzog and de Meuron's Bird's Nest Stadium and Foster's Beijing Airport better if you see them as having been made possible by a mix of high aesthetic ambition and cheap mass labor that exists in China at this moment 
but may not exist for too much longer. While you did not absolutely need to know that the Basques in northern Spain were eager to remake the old industrial city of Bilbao and do so in a way that would somehow bridge their own bourgeois provincial traditions with their even more potent radical tradition when they turned to Frank Gehry and the Guggenheim Museum to create a new symbol and that they wanted the building both to stand out and to reflect the city. You surely understand the building better if you know something of these origins and can recognize that there are more complicated and subtle ways to demonstrate respect for context than replication. Still, of course, when we strip away all the layers of history and finance and zoning and construction and politics and get beyond the arguments about what kind of environment is best for educating people or healing people or housing people, we are left with the reality that a building is an object. That's what buildings are. Physical objects with walls, floors, ceilings, roofs, doors, and windows, which look a particular way and function a particular way. That's what you think about every day and what a critic has to think about if he or she is going to do his job. Evaluating how a building looks as a physical object and how it functions will always be the core of the obligation of architecture criticism. Every critic needs to feel that the greatest moments of all are those when he or she can call attention to those buildings that, in Lewis Mumford's words, cause people to hold their breath for a stabbing moment or that restore them to equilibrium by offering them a prospect of space and form joyfully mastered. Matthew Arnold, as Eric Moss has already so brilliantly told you, define criticism as a disinterested endeavor to learn and propagate the best that is known and thought in the world. Implicit within that is an obligation to share your judgments as well as your enthusiasms. Both judgment and enthusiasm can be ways of expressing love. And a critic who does not love his field cannot last very long in it. To love the thing, and also to love what it means in other people's lives, and not only your own, is, I think it's fair to say, a further prerequisite to functioning well as a critic. It's not inconsistent with exercising judgment. Judgment and education go hand in hand and are part of a critic's role as a kind of interpreter to communicate his or her love of things and, in so doing, instill love in others. A key difference between an architect and a critic, or a theoretician and a critic, is that in both cases, the former has a right, even an obligation, to proceed from a theoretical viewpoint, while no such obligation exists for a critic. Indeed, the opposite is true. A sh critic should not believe that there is only one right way to do things. The belief that there's only a single solution to a problem can strengthen the work of the architect, and it can enable the thinking of the theorist. You don't want an architect who sees too many ways to go and who does not feel a passionate drive toward one of them. But that worldview actually weakens the work of the critic, who needs to proceed from what's at least a nominally pluralist position. If not, he forfeits his ability to interpret, explain, and judge the work that's before him. But a critic has to stand for something. He or she cannot proceed from the view that anything is acceptable as long as it's well done. So how do you combine the absence of a rigid ideology with some guiding principles that are necessary for criticism? The answer, I think, lies in the difference between what we might call social or moral or ethical issues and aesthetic ones, between issues of social and political responsibility and issues of aesthetic choice. A critic can and should establish a set of social and political principles 
that define his judgment and act as a foundation for his criticism. The challenge is to hold on to these principles and at the same time to remain open to a broader range of aesthetic responses to these principles than any one single architect might have. And then to be able to judge these different aesthetic responses on their own terms. The issue of the relationship between aesthetics and politics seems particularly charged today in an age in which there's been a significant surge of conservative political sentiment, which has often seemed to be paired with pressure for conservative or traditional architectural solutions. I hesitate to suggest a causal relationship here. I really don't believe that conservative politics automatically equals an insistence on traditional architecture, or conversely, that a preference for traditional architecture necessarily connects to conservative politics. Those automatic associations are silly at best and actually quite dangerous at worst. Still, that being said, the climate is a pretty strange one right now when the biggest architectural story in Washington is the attack on the Frank Gehry design for the Eisenhower Memorial, much of which seems to be motivated by a demand that the memorial be redesigned in the classical style, an insistence that has often been suggested, been, been accompanied rather by the suggestion that Gehry's design shows insufficient respect for the principles and politics of Eisenhower. In the age of the Tea Party, of course, Eisenhower seems hardly a bona fide Republican anymore, since his politics would hardly pass muster with the Tea Party. By comparison to this year's crop of Republican presidential candidates, you might almost think of Eisenhower as a bit of a lefty. But that only makes this story even more complicated. The problem in this case is also how to separate the concept of an official style, which is what the opponents seem to believe that classicism should be in Washington from the challenge of creating an effective and moving memorial to an unusual and important figure in modern American history. The only man since Ulysses S. Grant to have served both as an important general in a major war and as president of the United States. Should this man of the 20th century be memorialized with essentially the same architecture that Grant was honored with in the 19th century? Even if you think that's correct, recent experience in Washington, if the World War II memorial, which some of you may have seen, is to be any guide, suggests that we are no longer able to design classical memorials even when we want to, that have the power and the grace that we did in the days of Henry Bacon, say, who designed the Lincoln Memorial, or John Russell Pope, architect of the National Gallery of Art, two great Washington buildings that, for all their classicism, are brilliantly conceived buildings that are not copies of anything, and in which the 20th century is powerfully, if subtly, visible. The greatest memorial of our time is not the World War II one, which is pompous and banal. But Maya Lin's extraordinary Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which of course was also opposed bitterly by some who said that modernism was incapable of creating a, more, a memorial that would communicate adequately to the vast numbers of people who would see it. That it was an elite style, cold and abstract, revealing hostility rather than patriotism. Anyway, I would have thought that the success of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and the brilliance and power with which it does communicate to everyone would have been sufficient to have opened the door to more willingness to continue to invent new forms of expression to honor great Americans, but no such luck. The battle going on in Washington now bears an eerie similarity to the one that took place more than 30 years ago about the Vietnam Memorial, and I raise it now not only to remind you how suspect modern architecture remains in the minds of so many people, 
but also to underscore the extent to which this whole business reminds us that architecture can't be discussed in purely formal or aesthetic terms without at least some discussion of the difficult political context in which it inevitably plays out. And the dismissive and hostile tone of the arguments about the Eisenhower Memorial in Washington is deeply troubling as a testament to the to where the public discourse, excuse me, to where the public discourse about architecture stands right now. No more encouraging in terms of public discourse are a couple of other situations in other parts of the United States where important modern buildings were constructed and are now in danger of demolition. The first is in upstate New York, where one of Paul Rudolph's public buildings, the 1971 Orange County Government Center, and here I have to admit for the first time that now I'm actually sorry I don't have images because this one is a building many of you may not know. In any case, Rudolph's great government center in Orange County is closed because of water damage after a hurricane. And the county executive wants to tear it down and replace it with a mock Georgian structure of red brick. Now, Paul Rudolph is difficult. And in general, his buildings are not what you would describe as user-friendly. They do not recede into the background. But at their best, they are extraordinary investigations into the nature of space and surface. And they place human activity within a dynamic set of forms that at its best is ennobling. They are buildings that demand more for us, from us and that give us more in return. It's an obligation of architecture criticism, I think, to explain that equation and to help people make a judgment as to whether that price is worth paying. Unfortunately, this particular dispute is colored by, big surprise here, nasty disputes about money, as well as style, since the advocates of tearing down the building just happen to have studies that purport to prove that renovation is much more expensive than new construction. Advocates of keeping the building have numbers that say exactly the opposite. Probably the particular solution that that county executive wants, the banal Georgian building, is cheaper because it's as plain vanilla a building as you can imagine. It lacks not only architectural ambition, it lacks the dignity and the grander ambitions of Rudolph, who truly wanted to make a statement about the importance of civic life and the high value citizens could place on the workings of their government. He also, of course, wanted to make a statement about innovation, about fresh thinking and new ideas, things that it often seems were valued in government more a generation ago than they are now. Whatever else you can say about the Rudolph Building, it is not government architecture for the age of the Tea Party. Neither is another building I should mention here that's also in danger. Bertrand Goldberg's Prentice Women's Hospital in Chicago, also from the 1970s, a cloverleaf structure with round windows cantilevered over a Miesian base. It was an early attempt at rethinking healthcare design, and it was also one of the very first buildings to be designed with the age of computers, though what they did was quite primitive by our standards. In any event, Northwestern University, which owns the building, wants to tear it down and put a medical research tower on the site. Their hospital has multiple alternative sites nearby, but they refuse to use any of them. And they've mounted a campaign against saving the building, stating that preservationists are against medical research. In other words, Northwestern is saying, you can save this building or you can save human lives. Which do you prefer? Well, we couldn't be better thrust back into the arena of architecture and social responsibility than this argument, which attempts to pit architectural form against social benefit and suggests that saving a building will have a direct and negative effect on the social fabric. This is the worst kind of architecture society connection to argue for since it's so utterly disingenuous. It's a completely fake dichotomy. 
a fake opposition because you can, of course, believe entirely in the value of medical research and still believe that there are benefits to saving the older building. One does not preclude the other. In the case of Northwestern, they just have to put the new research tower across the street on land they already own or that their affiliate hospital already owns. For all I'm arguing for evaluating architecture in its social and political context and not seeing form in a vacuum, I don't buy the architecture versus human life arguments. If you put architecture up against food, food will win, as it should. Food is about sustaining life. Architecture is about giving the already sustained life deeper meaning. Floating over all of this, I suppose, is yet another question, which is the extent to which architecture critics have a responsibility to the avant-garde, a responsibility to support the new, or in the case of Paul Rudolph and Bertrand Goldberg, to support the once avant-garde. If they don't, the argument might go, who will outside of architects themselves? There is some truth to this, although I have a visceral reaction against critics who support the new reflexively as automatically as some reject it. But I do think it's worth remembering that in architecture criticism, as in art criticism, the critics whose voices have, have mattered most over time have been the ones who bring to the table at least a significant degree of sympathy for the new. Mumford and Huxtable did not become the most enduring critical voices of the 20th century by virtue of rejecting innovation and invention. They did not accept it uncritically, and they often judged it harshly. But there was always a sense of belief in the notion that, architect, that, that as architects throughout history had looked for new ways to make form, so can architects today, and that the critic can and should encourage the best of them. In art criticism, consider how many people today remember Royal Cortisos, the famously reactionary art critic of the New York Herald Tribune, as compared, say, to Clement Greenberg or Harold Rosenberg, the greatest mid-century advocates of the new. John Kennedy, the art critic of the New York Times when the Guggenheim opened in 1959, is little remembered for his impassioned denunciation of Wright's great building. Even though some of his points about some of that building's issues were true, his writing today now looks like a desperate attempt to swim upstream against the current or to reject out of fear what he did not understand. If architecture matters, it should go without saying then that criticism matters. It is, after all, the closest thing we have to a living guide to architecture, what it means and how it affects us. But to say that criticism matters because architecture matters is not enough, because criticism has to matter on its own terms as well. It matters if it can change architecture, and it matters if it can change people's lives, helping them to understand the architecture they live with and to make it better. For a long time, critics yearned for an age when people paid more attention to architecture, when society cared about it. Beware of what you wish for, as they say, because we've now gotten that wish, and it's a mixed bag. If we once expected too little of architecture, I fear that today some of us may expect too much of it. It's worth remembering, I think, that architecture does not cure cancer, and it does not put bread on the table. It is not justice in the courtroom or peace on the battlefield. If there's anything that every critic needs to be mindful of today, it's that architecture is not going to solve all of our problems. It does not sustain life. But as I said, it can make the, the already sustained life much more meaningful much more pleasurable, and it's the critic's job 
in a way to encourage, observe, and support this process, enhancing the impact of architecture as a resonant presence in all of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know we like to have some questions, so happy to uh, respond to anything that raised or didn't raise or anything I said or should have said or didn't say or didn't say the way you would have wanted me to. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, just wait for the mic to make it there. Hi. Uh, Hi. Yeah. <laughs> when you were speaking, you said that um, an architect shouldn't have, uh, he should have his, a singular ideal or something behind his building, that he sh shouldn't have too many, that he shouldn't have too many solutions. Right. Um, but shouldn't an architect attempt to incorporate different ideas into his building or different ideals at the same time to accomplish a greater whole? Or do you think there's a line that should be drawn at some point between when you have too much or when you have too little in a thought process when creating a building? Well, um, that's a complex question. Um, I think an architect has to remember that he or she cannot solve every problem with every building and cannot use every building as an excuse to show everything he or she has learned his entire life because it usually won't work. Um, that's, that's one part of the answer. But let me also step back and, and try to clarify what I was trying to say a little bit more. Um, by saying an architect should have a clear vision of one solution, I did not mean that every architect should go to a client and say, this is what it's going to be, and if you don't like it, you can go shove it and find another architect. Um, that's not what I was saying at all. I meant every architect should have a sense that this is a particular direction in which the solution should go. That direction might, in fact, yield uh, multiple variations that can be tweaked and improved and studied and altered and so forth. Um, but uh, an architect should not, a strong architect will not come and say, you know, will, will not think of the design process as like taking dictation from the client. I mean, obviously, there should be a vision, a, a sense that the right way to solve this problem is in this direction. And then within that direction, there can be, you know, there's a certain amount of room to play, hopefully. And because also every work of architecture ultimately is also the product of a dialogue between a client and an architect. But the range of that dialogue should not be 360 degrees. It should be within a certain framework that the architect is comfortable with or it's the wrong match of architect and client. Or the wrong, that, that, that's all I meant to say. Um, whereas a critic should have a more Catholic, with a small c, viewpoint um, because it's the obligation of a critic to be able to judge um, things on their own terms as well as by his or her standards. Um, I mean, there's a, I don't mean, I don't want to harp on all this classical business, uh, but there's an architect, architecture critic rather, who drives me particularly crazy uh, at the Providence Journal in Providence, Rhode Island, who is a sort of one of those classical fundamentalists. He's like the classical Taliban. And he's only able to evaluate buildings by how many like, little things on a traditional scale he can check off. And there's only one measure, and that's it. And he is you know, 
he has written about how you know Bilbao is a stupid waste of time because it doesn't look like the National Gallery of Art. I mean, it's just beyond any reason. So that you know, and that kind of ideology, I think, has no place in criticism. It's just simple-minded and stupid. Um, but an architect has a right to feel driven toward one direction. That, that, that's all I really meant to say. Not that there shouldn't be plenty of room for dialogue, discussion, variation, and everything else. Wouldn't it? Um, any other? Uh,